Hello, I'm JW. Uh, this time it's part two of the bonding and earthing series, and of course this time it's bonding. Earthing was done last time, so obviously uh, have a look at that video if you haven't already seen it. And uh, this part we're going to have a look at bonding as in the main protective bonding. Uh, we'll have a look at supplementary bonding uh, next time. So uh, first of all, let's have a look at the definitions and let's see what those are. Now there's various definitions of uh, bonding in the definition section, but uh, the main one here is uh, equipotential bonding, which is an electrical connection maintaining various exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts at substantially the same potential. And it says, uh, see also protective equipotential bonding. And protective equipotential bonding is uh, equipotential bonding for the purposes of safety, so uh, fairly obvious there. So that's the uh, equipotential bonding, and uh, notice it uh, connects both the exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts. Now we looked at uh, exposed conductive parts on the last episode, and uh, as I said before, that was uh, the conductive part of equipment, which can be touched, and again that's your sort of metal socket outlets and uh, fixing screws and so on, which uh, of course is not normally live, but can become live if there's a fault, such as the uh, shorting onto the uh, metal case of a socket or something. And the other definition here is extraneous conductive part, so uh, still conductive and still a part, but in this case extraneous. And uh, this is a conductive part liable to introduce a potential, generally earth potential, and not forming part of the electrical installation. So uh, this will be conductive items, again typically made of metal, and uh, not part of the electrical installation. And this will cover things like gas and water pipes that come into the building, and of course various other things as well. And it's important to note the difference between these two because they have a similar name. They are totally different items. The exposed one is always parts which are part of the electrical installation, and extraneous conductive parts are not part of the electrical installation. But of course, uh, they are conductive, just the same as the uh, exposed ones are. Now, Regulation 411312 here, which is uh, protective equipotential bonding, gives an example of uh, the most common items which would be considered extraneous conductive parts. So we've got uh, water installation pipes and gas installation pipes, and we've also got uh, other installation pipe work and ducting, central heating and air conditioning systems, and exposed metallic structural parts of the building. And certainly the uh, water and gas are by far the most common, and uh, of course the others uh, do exist in a fair number of locations. And there may be other parts here which of course are not listed. It all depends on uh, the exact installation in question. And there's a few notes here as well. Uh, connection of a lightning protection system should also be uh, connected there in accordance with this other standard. And uh, when installation serves more than one building, although that's not particularly common, these uh, requirements should be applied to each building. And uh, another note here about the uh, metallic sheath of a telecoms cable, and that would normally be a sort of underground armoured type cable. Again, that should be connected, but uh, the uh, consent of the operator owner of the cable should be obtained. And that's a relatively unusual one, but uh, nevertheless it is included. Now the section which deals with the uh, size of uh, main protective bonding conductors is uh, 544, and that's part of chapter 54, which is the same one that has all the stuff about the protective conductors in. And again, that's the one we looked at in the previous episode. So um, here we are, 54411, and uh, this is regarding the size of uh, main protective bonding conductors. And as I said here, uh, except where PME conditions apply, the main protective bonding conductor should have a cross-sectional area of not less than half the cross-sectional area required for the earthing conductor of the installation, and not less than six square millimetres in any case. So uh, if you've got your 16 millimetre, say, earthing conductor, then of course half of that is eight, which of course is more than six, so eight would be fine, but uh, of course in reality you can't buy eight square millimetres, so it usually ends up as being ten. And of course, if your earthing conductor is smaller than this, then it's perfectly acceptable to have a uh, bonding conductor that's smaller than, say, the 10, providing, of course, it's not less than the 6. So in practicality, 6 is going to be your minimum size, as there's not a standard size of wire between 6 and 10. And it says here again, it need not exceed 25 square millimetres if it's made of copper or some other similar metal uh, offering the equivalent conductance. And uh, note this only applies to... Uh, non-PME supplies, so essentially you're talking about your TNS and TT supplies. Uh, in the event of a PME supply, which is generally the uh, TNCS arrangement, then it's a question of selecting it from this table, 
and as you can see here that the minimum size then is 10 square millimetres and that's for uh, supplies up to 35 square millimetres or less and again as the size increases of course the minimum size increases also but certainly for a uh, domestic property highly unlikely to have a supply above 35 so 10 is generally the standard size used and certainly even with other types of supplies it generally ends up that 10 is the one that's going to be used mainly because it's just convenient and uh, of course with a minimum of uh, 6 up there it's either going to have to be 6 or 10 so uh, say it's usually 10 because obviously it's to avoid having to buy a separate roll of 6 just for those individual installations. And then the uh, second part here is the uh, location that the main protective bonding connection should be made and it says here on any gas, water or other service shall be made as near as practicable to the point of entry of that service into the premises. Notice the word uh, practicable, it doesn't mean you have to uh, dismantle half the building just to get it uh, right where it comes in the building but uh, as long as it's uh, near or as close as possible to where it comes in that's fine. And again, where practical, it should be made within 600 millimetres of the metre outlet or the uh, point of entry of the building if the metre is external. So generally 600 millimetres or say a couple of feet within the where it comes in, but again, in some circumstances it won't be practical to do that, so of course uh, slightly further away can be done. And the other point here is it should be made before any branch pipe work, so uh, this is because if you made it after some joints, the pipe work may be altered in the future, and of course it may end up that it's uh, no longer connected or someone may have installed a plastic section or something in there or uh, insulating part. So uh, as near as possible to where it comes in and of course uh, ideally before any branches or joints in the pipes. So let's have a look at how this would work in a real installation. So what we've got here is the uh, supply coming into the building with a fuse or whatever, your electricity meter and then your consumer unit or fuse box. And of course the uh, line and neutral wires come out of there through the electricity meter and then into your consumer unit there and obviously the wires then will go off to your various circuits elsewhere in the building. And for this one we'll say that it's a uh, TNS arrangement so that's where the typically would be connected via the covering of the incoming cable and uh, the earth wire of course will come along and we'll put an external main earthing terminal in this case. So that's your main uh, earthing conductor coming in there. And of course from here you're going to have uh, certainly wire from there going into your consumer unit. So we'll uh, just draw that in and that will go up into the bar inside the unit there. And then of course your circuit protective conductors will attach here, one for each of the circuits that you have. Now the most common items to uh, connect the protective equitential bonding to are the gas and water supplies. And of course in a real installation they can be very far away and if you're unlucky on the other side of a terraced house with concrete floors and of course upstairs they've just laid out some expensive laminate or real wood flooring that they don't want removing. Too bad in that case. So uh, we'll put in the uh, water and gas. So uh, let's put the water in first of all. So put that over here as just a uh, metallic pipe. And a lot of properties of course they're plastic now but uh, in this instance we'll assume that it's actually a metallic pipe. So of course uh, you would need a wire from here and that would of course go across to the water pipe and attach to the pipe using a suitable clamp. Now of course water is going to be permeating to pretty much uh, every property and the uh, second most common item is the gas supply and I'll just draw the uh, gas meter in here. And again, as with the uh, water, there'll be a uh, wire from here, and that will go across to the consumer side of the gas meter. So, of course, this is what comes in from outside. There's your gas meter, and then you're connecting onto the consumer side of the meter, not to the uh, incoming pipework. Now here we've got two separate uh, wires, one for the uh, gas there and one for the water. And of course in many cases the gas and water are going to be in completely different parts of the building. So of course that's what you would do. But uh, in the event where they're actually close together like this, you can actually just use a single bonding conductor. And uh, in the case of that, then it's important to make sure that it's a continuous piece. So you would come to here and loop the actual wire through this connector and then go on to the 
gas up there. And this is because if this was disconnected for some reason, we don't want the situation where if this was taken off for whatever purpose, that then you've got two ends here, which means that the gas is disconnected as well. So as long as the wire goes in, loops through the connector and comes out, that's fine. What you don't want is to have two separate wires going into the connector, or worse, have a separate uh, clamp on there, and then one going off to that, because of course then there's a good possibility if one is disconnected, of course the other is going to be disconnected at the same time, so that's uh, not what you want at all. But of course in many cases they're going to be in, say, different parts of the building anyhow, so of course two separate wires uh, is pretty much the only way you could do that. Now in terms of the services that can come into the building, you've got uh, water of course being the uh, most common, and in fact pretty much every building is going to have some sort of a water supply. And in terms of being extraneous, of course that's referring to being outside, so obviously uh, water is going to come into the building from some external source. And in terms of it being conductive, well of course if it's in a metal pipe, And of course metal is conductive, so that's your extraneous conductive part. So in the case of metal pipe, of course, uh, then yes, that will definitely need a protective equipotential bonding. However, certainly on newer installations and uh, ones which have been upgraded, it's very common now to see uh, plastic pipes for water coming in. And of course the water is still coming in from outside, so it's still extraneous, but obviously plastic is not conductive, so therefore it's not an extraneous conductive part. So in the case of plastic pipe work, then of course bonding is not required. And of course it would be very silly to attempt to attach a copper cable onto a plastic pipe, that's going to achieve absolutely nothing. So uh, plastic pipe of course not required, simply the fact that it's not conductive. Now gas is by far the uh, second most common item. And gas is, of course, supplied in metal pipes. Which again makes it conductive, and it's coming in from outside, so it's going extraneous. So as before, of course, that would need to be uh, bonded as well. Now gas outside in the street, where the pipes are buried on the ground, is frequently put in plastic pipes these days. They're generally yellow. You may have seen those when they're being installed. However, those plastic pipes do not come into the building generally, they're not actually supposed to, and the pipes certainly coming into the building will be metallic, so uh, the likelihood of a plastic gas main being in your house is pretty much zero, and uh, certainly if you found such a thing it would uh, probably require some investigation as to how it actually got there. So gas pretty much always is going to be metal, and obviously you're going to need the uh, bonding on that. And certainly the pipes inside the building for gas, they will not be plastic, they're always going to be metal as well, so uh, again there's no uh, plastic pipe situation applicable there. Now I'd say those are by far the most common items there, and bearing in mind that gas of course doesn't necessarily mean natural gas, it could be gas coming from a gas storage thing outside in the garden, sort of the uh, propane or whatever, and again it's always going to have the uh, metallic piping. And another one to look for is oil, and this is typically where you've got no gas supply in the area, so you have a big oil tank put outside which uh, powers your central heating boiler and whatever. And as before, again, it's quite usually the case that it's going to be a metallic pipe coming into the building. And of course, as before, we're going to require that to be bonded, because again, it's extraneous coming in from outside, and obviously it's made of metal, so therefore it's certainly a conductive item, so there's your extraneous conductive part. And the other one to look for, particularly in uh, domestic properties, and this is uh, certainly in the older ones, is a uh, soil pipe or soil stack. And this is the one that connects to the toilet and uh, takes all the sewage away. And of course on newer properties these are made of plastic, so again not a problem, but certainly on older ones, sort of 40 plus years old, uh, these pipes are actually made out of cast iron, and of course being uh, buried in the ground they're an extraneous conductive part, and obviously made of metal, and of course they generally come into the bathroom and join straight onto the back of the toilet, so you've got this section of metal there course uh, is uh, completely accessible and therefore requires to be bonded. So uh, in that case, uh, yes it does need to be bonded. Now this only applies if the pipe can actually be accessed or is accessible. So obviously if it just comes straight through the wall and to the back of that sort of older type toilet, then of course that would require bonding. 
that can be quite a bother because the uh, pipes generally are sort of four to six inches diameter and therefore you need to get a uh, special clamp to fit on there. However in many cases a uh, pipe isn't going to be accessible so it might sort of be built in somewhere or concealed behind a panel in which case uh, it doesn't require bonding because it's not actually introducing a potential where anyone can actually touch it or reach it but of course it's all concealed away behind a uh, panel or some other box in section then uh, not a problem and of course it would be uh, pretty much impossible to join onto that if it was concealed anyway. And again in properties that have been uh, refurbished or altered it's quite common to find that outside you've got the uh, metal cast iron pipe but where it comes into the bathroom that piece may well have been replaced with plastic so again uh, doesn't actually require in doing it in that situation. Now there's a couple of other things which uh, may occur and certainly do occur quite often in domestic properties and the first of these is central heating. Now central heating typically is uh, piped in uh, copper piping although again plastic can be used but uh, certainly very common still to have it made in copper piping so it's certainly a conductive part but is it an extraneous conductive part? Well usually no it isn't because it's generally contained within the building obviously you're not uh, heating up the street or your next door neighbours so in that regard it's not an extraneous conductive part and uh, in that case it would not require bonding so no bonding required there. However depending on the layout of the building and where the pipes are installed it is possible for it to become an extraneous conductive part really depending on where the pipe work has been installed and one example of this might be say in a bungalow where the pipes were put in when the building was constructed and of course if they are buried in the concrete floor as is typically the case in that style of building then of course it is an extraneous conductive part then because again it's buried in the floor concrete being uh, reasonably conductive in terms of its uh, contact with the ground so certainly in that situation yes it is an extraneous conductive part and therefore it would require bonding. So pipes in the concrete therefore would definitely require bonding as that would then become an extraneous conductive part. And the same would apply to a water pipe for example if they went into the uh, solid floor and then came up somewhere else because that would make them an extraneous conductive part. So even if you had a plastic pipe coming into the building if you've got older metal piping that's uh, partly concealed in the floor then again that would require bonding. And another issue with uh, central heating systems where you may find that it's uh, actually turned into an extraneous conductive part is where you may have a drain point for sort of draining out the water for maintenance or whatever and of course that may have been taken outside the building to a convenient uh, sort of drain or whatever. So of course if the pipe's going outside then it's become an extraneous conductive part and obviously then that would require bonding. Now of course you're not normally have the heating pipes outside but certainly say things like a drain or some uh, similar part then again that will require bonding. But uh, note in many cases that the uh, central heating system is actually going to be connected to the uh, incoming water supply anyhow so you may actually find that uh, it's all linked together anyway but of course it uh, had a situation where say the pipes coming into the building for the water were made of plastic and the uh, central heating was all done in copper and of course it may be necessary to install a protective bond to the central heating system assuming that wasn't already in place via some other means so say for example through the water system. Now the point of having main equipotential bonding is to ensure that any extraneous conductive parts as in this uh, water pipe here are kept at or near the same potential as anything in the building such as your exposed conductive part of an appliance such as a heater for example when the fault occurs. Now in this situation here we've just got the uh, line of neutral coming in for the heating element and of course the metal casing of the heater is connected to the main earthing terminal and of course that's connected to the uh, means of earthing there which is an electrode in the ground in this case and of course at the moment uh, this is uh, at the uh, same potential as the ground being uh, connected there and of course the uh, metal water pipe is also at that same potential again that's uh, buried in the ground as well so no problem there so if you were to measure the voltage between here and here just by putting a uh, voltage meter in there then of course you'd find that there was zero because of course they're both uh, connected to the ground so no voltage would occur there and of course you wouldn't expect there to be a voltage because uh, although the uh, heater is turned on of course all the uh, current is flowing by the path it should be there's no actual fault there. However the situation changes significantly if a fault was to occur inside the heater. 
And of course, this might be that the element has uh, shorted onto the casing of the heater like that. Now, in this situation, of course, there's going to be a fuse up here somewhere, and of course, that fuse is designed to fail and disconnect the supply, or maybe a circuit breaker or some other device. But before it does that, there's going to be a situation where you've got a voltage on the uh, casing of the piece of equipment here, and of course that voltage depends on the uh, earth electrode impedance, and of course this can be fairly large. Now if that was the only thing in the room, again, it's not really a problem because uh, although you actually might be touching this, you're not actually connected to anything else, so you wouldn't actually necessarily get a shock from that. But the problem occurs when you've got another part inside, like this metal water pipe, and if the person was unlucky enough to be touching both the water pipe and the metal casing of the heater, and bearing in mind this is actually quite an easy situation, so for example the heater might be a water heater supplying the hot tap on your basin in the bathroom, and of course your cold water pipe coming into the cold tap, so if you're holding both the taps at the same time and a fault occurred, then you could be having uh, one hand on each of these items. And of course any voltage there means it's going to go straight through your heart, and uh, that could easily kill somebody. So in this circumstance we've got a voltage appearing on this metal casing, which of course is going to be considerably higher than the zero volts effectively on the metal water pipe. So you're going to get a voltage between here, and certainly on a TT system this voltage can actually be quite large. And although it's only there for a very short time, basically the time it takes the protective device to disconnect, nevertheless it's still there, and of course that's most undesirable, and of course it doesn't take very long to uh, give someone an electric shock and cause injury or even kill somebody. Now the reason why this is particularly important with a TT system, where you've got the earth electric in the ground, is because this earth connection here is going to have a fairly high impedance, and say on a TT system there it might have say around a 50 ohm impedance, and this, uh, compared to the impedance of the other parts of the system, the metallic wires and things, this is actually huge compared to the fairly tiny impedance of the incoming wires. And the uh, upshot of all this is that when the fault occurs here, the voltage on this is going to be pretty much at mains potential, so sort of around 240 volts. And if you've got some other thing here, like this metal pipe coming in, which of course is going to be at the same potential as the ground outside, then you can actually end up with a surprisingly large voltage between these two, and it can actually approach the full 240 volts. And of course that's going to be very dangerous. And of course the main bonding prevents this from happening by ensuring that your other wire from here goes across to this metallic part. And though you've still got this large 50 ohm impedance for the actual means of earthing, you've now ensured that the path between here and here is actually very low resistance or low impedance, because you've got those metallic wires connecting them together, and therefore it minimises the voltage that's going to appear between these two parts. And generally it's going to keep it in the order of only a few volts or so, which of course is uh, much safer than having, say, a 150 or something appearing between there. And this is why when installing any electrical equipment, it's important to make sure that the main bonding is actually installed, and also that it's electrically continuous. Obviously it might have been damaged here or something, or uh, disconnected in some fashion. To say without it, then there's a good chance of the uh, extraneous conductive parts and the exposed conductive parts having different voltages on them. And of course, that's when you're going to get that shock if you're, say, holding onto a uh, cold tap or something and touch the water heater at the same time. And this is something where an RCD is not going to help the situation at all. If you had an RCD in the uh, circuit up here, of course, that's going to disconnect the supply in the event of a fault like this. But bearing in mind that a fault like this, and it's going to be disconnected by the fuse or whatever anyhow, and even though the RCD would obviously assist in disconnecting the supply, for the duration it takes that to disconnect, which could be sort of 0.2 seconds, you're still going to have that dangerous voltage appearing here if the main bonding is not installed. Now on a TNS or a TNCS system, of course the earth impedance is going to be very much lower than this, in the order of less than 1 ohm, so the problem there isn't as apparent. But certainly on a TNCS system, which is by far the most common on new installations, there's another issue which can occur, and I've done a video on this before, and it's where the conductor coming to the building, the uh, combined neutral and earth conductor, is damaged, and then this results in the metalwork in the building reaching mains voltage, and then there's nothing to actually disconnect it. And again, in this case, uh, the uh, main bonding will assist in this situation, because otherwise you'd have live parts in the building, 
due to the uh, failure in the combined neutral and earth. And then you've got earthed metal parts in the building coming in from outside. And then you're going to have pretty much the full mains voltage again between those components. And again, by installing the bonding here, such as connecting between the uh, exposed conductive parts and the extraneous ones, you're helping to keep the voltage between the two at the same level or very close to that. And again, it minimises the risk of shock to anyone inside the building. And this is also why on a TNCS system, these conductors here need to be at least 10 millimetres in size. Because in the case of that uh, conductor being damaged, you're going to get a significant amount of current flowing through some of these. And it will depend on the uh, other people in the street and various other combinations and where the actual break is. But certainly you could get uh, many tens of amps flowing through these for an extended period. So hence that's why the uh, minimum size is considerably larger on the TNCS system. So that's a look at the main protective bonding. And of course that's the one where you're connecting the uh, gas and water pipes, for example, and other extraneous conductive parts to your main earthing terminal. And of course the point of it is to ensure that in the event of various types of fault, the extraneous conductive parts, such as your water pipes, are kept at the same or very similar voltage to any of the exposed conductive parts, which is parts of your electrical installation. And of course that's to avoid people getting a shock, say from uh, holding onto a cold tap, while switching on the electric water heater in the bathroom. And so if you didn't have that in place, then there's a very good possibility of very large voltages appearing between those two parts, and of course uh, giving people electric shocks. And note it's not necessarily the case that the fault has to be in the same area as the person is uh, actually standing there. So for example on the TNCS system, if the combined neutral and earth coming into the building was damaged outside of the building, you're going to get dangerous voltages appearing on the exposed conductive parts of the installation. Again, I've done a video on that uh, previously. And if you didn't have that protective bonding in place, then you're going to have pretty much mains potential on the, say, light switches and socket outlets and other metal parts. But of course your cold water pipe, for example, would have pretty much zero potential, and you're going to have that full mains voltage appearing between them. That, uh, put the bonding in place though, and that ensures that the voltage between those various parts is uh, kept to a minimum. Uh, next time we'll have a look at the supplementary bonding, and that involves bathrooms particularly and various other locations. But until then, thanks for watching.